Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 18.30 South African time. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the final and the revision lecture of this CSA Level 3 course. My usual co-presenter uh, is currently um, doing a Level 1 face-to-face uh, -face course. Um, hence, I'll be flying solo tonight, but I will be ably assisted uh, by my colleague uh, Volma, who will assist me when we open the floor for Q&A. The format for this evening's uh, revision lecture will be as follows. I will go through all the revision questions uh, that we covered from level from lecture one up until lecture six. After that, I will open the floor for, uh, for Q&A. And then lastly, I will cover a bit of admin with regards to the exams that you will write um, either next week, Wednesday, or next week, Saturday. So to start off for this evening, the we co we first covering the questions that we dealt with in Lecture one. In a three day game, close of play on day one is 17.30. Team A is all out at 17.22 for three marks. What happens next? Law tells us that when an innings ends, when there are 10 minutes or less remaining before the close of time, close of time play on any day, there shall be no further play on that particular day. Also, no change shall be made to the time for the start of play the following day. So yes, we ended, we're supposed to end at 17.30. But because uh, a side was dismissed at 17.22, which falls within 10 minutes or less before the agreed scheduled close of play, law tells us that that is stumps for that particular day. And yes, we ended eight minutes earlier, but law also guide us here and, and tell us that even though we ended eight minutes earlier, we shall not maybe uh, make up that eight minutes the following day. So yeah, just to confirm again, those eight minutes shall not be made up that we lost on day one. Second question. Day two of a three day game and lunch is from 12.20 until one o'clock. When we got to 12.20, we were only midway through the over. We then finished the over and lunch was only taken or the umpire called over time and lunch only at 12.22. And when we took lunch, team A was in 3.38 for 7. At 12.46, the captain of team A informs you that she is declaring for three points. What happens next? So firstly, if a captain declares an innings close during a scheduled interval or an interruption that is of more than 10 minutes duration, no adjustment shall be made to the time for the resumption of play and the 10 minute interval shall be included in the interval or the interruption. So lunch was taken at 12.22, so lunch being 40 minutes, the first ball needs to be bowled at 13.02. So the, so the start of the innings of team B, well, the first ball, 12.13.02. The change of innings will be included in the lunch interval. Day three of a four-day 
provincial match. Lunch is again from 12.20 till 1 o'clock. Team A gets dismissed at 12.13 for three points. What happens next? Law tells us that if an innings ends with 10 minutes or less remaining before the agreed time for the lunch interval, the interval shall be taken immediately. And also, the, um, it shall be then the agreed duration of the interval. And in, and in most competitions, um, the lunch interval is 40 minutes. And the 10-minute change of innings interval shall be included in the lunch interval. So in this example, the innings ended at 12.13. The law tells us that if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, which is in this case, we'll take lunch immediately. So with lunch being 40 minutes, so we took lunch at 12.13, lunch will then end or the first ball needs to be bowled at 12.53. And the 10 minute change of innings interval will be included in the lunch interval. Again, lunch from 12.20 till 1 o'clock. At 12.05, it starts to rain and the players need to leave the field for three points. What happens next? So lunch at 12.20, 12.05, it starts raining. And this is 15 minutes to lunchtime. What does law tell us? What must we do? Law tells us that if for any reason players need to leave the field, and in this example, it started raining and they had to leave the field, and when there are more than 10 minutes remaining, before the agreed time for lunch, then to take an early lunch, the umpires and both captains need to agree to take an early lunch. If there's no agreement between the umpires and the captains, lunch shall be taken at the scheduled time of 12.20. So uh, uh, the subsection of this law uh, uh, tells us if it rains 10 minutes or less before the lunch interval, then you can take lunch uh, immediately. But if more than 10 minutes, which is in this case, you need to, there are conditions that needs to be met. Captains and umpires must agree to take an early lunch. If there's no agreement, lunch shall be taken at 12.20. Now we go to tea time. So in this three-day game, tea time is from three o'clock till 15.20. At 14.35, team A gets dismissed after facing 64.4 overs from the allotted 100 overs of the day. For four points, what happens uh, next? And in this question, we are incorporating a better a playing condition um, into this. Um, for the level three exam, 95% of the exam will be based on law. There are one or two playing conditions that, uh, that will be incorporated. This is one of them, uh, um, but you don't need to worry. If um, we've covered, if there was a playing condition that was incorporated into this exam, we definitely covered uh, them in the lectures as well as the revision uh, questions. So Lord tells us, if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea, tea shall be taken immediately. Tea shall then be whatever the agreed duration, and usually it's 20 minutes in most competitions around the world, and the 10 minute change of innings interval shall be included in the T interval. 
So this innings ended 1435 with our scheduled tea being three o'clock. And because this is within uh, 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea, that's why we need to take the tea interval immediately. So we, we're taking tea at 1435 with tea being uh, um, 20 minutes. The first ball needs to be bowled at 1455. Also, uh, about the playing condition that was incorporated, uh, yeah, they do give you how many overs was bowled and how many overs in the day. And the moment you see they give you the overs bowled and they give you the total overs for the day, part of the answer that they're expecting in the exam is you need to tell them how many overs are left in the day. So again, the moment you see, they indicate in the question overs bold and they indicate total overs for the day. To get full marks, you need to tell them how many overs are left in the day. So since be all, because this change of innings interval took place during T, you will not be deducting any overs from the remaining left in the day. So usually, if there's a change of innings interval at any time during the day, you need to deduct three overs from the total overs for the day. So change of innings, any time happens during the day, you need to deduct three overs from the total overs for the day. Uh, but there is an exception. Unless that change of innings takes place during an interval or a or an interruption of more than 10 minutes. So in this example, the change of innings interval took place during tea time and hence no overs will be deducted from the remaining overs in the day's play. So I mentioned earlier, we deduct three overs for um, if for a change of innings interval. How did I get to three overs? The change of innings interval is 10 minutes. We, uh, according to law, we need to bowl three minutes per over. So if you divide, if you divide three into 10, you get 3.333, uh, but you always want more cricket. So you will take only three overs, only three full overs. You will ignore the part of uh, the the part of the over or, or the few the minute or two that's left. So the remaining overs for the day is 100 minus the 65. And how did I get 65? The batting, uh, the team A faced 64.4 overs. And you round that over up to the next whole number, which is 65 overs. So subtracting 65 from 100, you have 35 overs left minimum for the day. And if uh, this is to get four full marks for this question. Next question, three day game. T from 3 o'clock till 15.20. The captain of Team A declares at 14.23 after facing 59.1 overs of the allotted 100 overs in the day. For four marks, what happens next? So we know law tells us if an innings ends within 30 minutes or less from T, we will take T like in the previous example. But in this example, when did the innings end? When did the captain declare? The captain declared 14.23. Is this 30 minutes or less till tea time? No, it's not. It's 37 minutes till tea time. So what happens next? So if when 30 minutes remain before the agreed time for tea, an interval between innings is already in progress, play so I'll resume at the end of the 10-minute interval. 
So I mentioned earlier that the the declaration or the end of the innings happened at 14.23, and this is not within 30 minutes of the scheduled tea time at 3 o'clock. So we will now take a 10-minute change of innings interval from 14.23 until 14.33. So the innings of Team B will start at 14.33, and play will continue until 3 o'clock when we will take T. And to get full marks for this question, you need to indicate how many overs left for the day. So you will deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. So you take your 10 minutes, you divide it by three, that's how I get three overs. So to calculate the remaining overs for the day, you take your 100 overs, at you subtract the overs that was bold. In this case, it was 51.9.1. You round the 59.1 up to the next uh, uh, full over, which is 60 overs. And then you also deduct the three overs for the change of innings. So 100 minus 60 minus three gives you 37 overs. Last question for lecture one. Lunch is scheduled from four, uh, from 12.20 to 3 till 1 o'clock. At 12.17, Team A lose their ninth wicket. What happens next? Do you take lunch? Don't you take lunch? Does the, uh, the last batsman need to come in? Let's have a look at what the law tells us. The law tells us that if... A side is nine wickets down with three minutes remaining to the agreed time for either the lunch or the tea interval. So they need to be nine wickets down. And if they are nine wickets down, we will not take tea or lunch at the schedule time. We will play an extra 30 minutes to see if the fielding side can take the last wicket. So again, the side needs to be nine wickets down with three minutes to play. If, and if there are nine wickets down, we will play a further 30 minutes to give the fielding side the opportunity to take the final wicket. So you will extend lunch by 30 minutes. So from 12.20 until 12.50, or unless the 10th wicket gets taken. So let's say if you get to 12.50, so now in our scenario at 12.17, the ninth wicket fell, the, the number 11 batsman needs to come in. Play will then continue until 12.50. If still team A is still nine wickets down, if the fielding side could not get the 10th wicket, then you will take lunch at 12.50, and with lunch being 40 minutes, lunch will be then from 12.50 till, till, till 13.30. So that is if they could not take, the fielding side could not take the 10th the wicket. But let's say the fielding side take the 10th wicket, and let's say at 12.30 they, they took the 10th wicket, then lunch will be taken immediately, Lunch will be of 40 minutes duration, and lunch will then be from 12.30 until 13.10. The legs are two revision questions, and here we dealt with the last hour. So last hour starting at 5 o'clock. At 17.10, after 2.2 overs were bowled, there is a rain interruption. Play resumes at 17.23. So, step-by-step -step calculations, how many overs remains in the last hour? So, it's important in your exam 
that you do so the step by step calculation calculations so sometimes if you do make a, a, a slight calculation error um, and the person who's marking your your script could could see um, 95% uh, of your answer is correct just when you when you had to calculate the final answer there was a slight uh, mistake you can still get two or, or three marks but if you just put down the answer let's say there are five overs left and it's an uh, incorrect answer you'll get zero marks but if you do so your full calculation and there is a slight uh, uh, adding or subtracting mistake somewhere you can still get at least uh, one two or, th or three marks so it's important so how so your calculations uh, it will help you especially if if if, if it's this may be a slight error you can still pick up uh, one or two or three marks So, how many overs in the last hour? According to the laws of cricket, there are 20 overs in the last hour. So, in our example, the last hour started at 5 o'clock, and the last hour is 60 minutes, so from 5 till 6 o'clock. How many time did we lose for the rain interruption? 13 minutes. How did I get 13 minutes? It started raining at 17.10. Play resumed at 17.23, so that is 13 minutes. Law tells us that in terms of losing overs, you will lose one over for every full three minutes. So when, when it comes to losing overs, you only look at full three minutes. You ignore the point, you ignore the fractions. Only overs are lost for every full three minutes so in this example we lost 13 uh, minutes and if you, we know it's three minutes per over so if we divide 13 into three we get to 4.33 but we only lose four overs because law tells us that one over for every full three minutes And we know that 2.2 overs uh, were bold. So now to calculate how many overs left. So the calculation is as follows. We started with 20. We lost four overs due to rain. We've bowled 2.2 overs. And that will leave us with 13.4 overs remaining in the last hour. So if there's a rain interruption in the last hour, the formula to calculate how many overs are left in the last hour are, is as follows. The overs that you started with in the last hour, which will always be 20 according to law, you then subtract the overs lost that you calculated and then also subtract the overs that was bold and the answer that you left with, that is the the uh, minimum overs that needs to be bowled in the last hour. Question two. Here we deal with, uh, in question one, we dealt with when there is a rain interruption in the last hour and how to calculate how many overs left. In question two, we now dealing with and innings change in the last hour. So the last hour has started in this example. And after the last hour started, there is an innings change. And in this case, team A was bowled out. So how do we calculate how many overs remaining in the last hour if there is an innings change in the last hour? So last hour starts at five o'clock. At 19 minutes past five, after five overs, team A is dismissed. Now team B requires 64 runs to win the game. So step-by-step -step calcs, how to determine how many overs remaining in the last hour. 
again, advice here, do not just uh, put down your answer. So step-by-step -step calculations from the start until the end, how you got to the answer. If there's maybe a slight calculation error, you didn't add up or subtract correctly. Uh, instead of getting zero points, if you get the answer incorrect, if you put just the answer, let's say five overs left, and, it, and it's the incorrect answer, you'll get zero. But if you do, uh, so uh, in your answer set, step-by-step -step calculations, you can pick up one, two, or three uh, marks. So, law, law tells us that if there's an innings, uh, if there's a, a, a change of innings in the last hour, Two calculations needs to be made. So the moment you see an innings change in the last hour, you need to tell yourself, I need to do two calculations. What are those two calculations? We'll get to now. But then further, law tells us, after doing these two calculations, the greater number of these two calculations shall be the minimum number of overs that needs to be bowled in the in the innings. So again, if there's an innings air change, first thing that needs to uh, that you need to to do is you need to tell yourself innings change. Two calculations needs to be made. The bigger of the two uh, after doing the cal calculations, the greater of the two. That is my minimum number of overs. So what are these two calculations? The first one is it's called the calculation based on overs remaining. So your first calculation, overs remaining. So let's see how do we do uh, this calculation. The first thing you do is, at the conclusion of the innings, you write down the number of overs that are remaining in the last hour. You write that number down. How many overs remaining? So you know you started with 20. And you write down the uh, the um, you, so you need to do a calculation here. How many overs remaining to be bowled? That's the first thing. Second thing, after you're looking at your answer in bullet point number one, if that answer is not a whole number, you then round that number up to the next whole number. And lastly you will deduct three overs for the change of innings interval from the answer that you got in uh, either bullet point one or bullet uh, point two. So when you do a calculation based on overs remaining, first thing is you write down the number of overs that remains to be bowled. You write it down. If that is not a whole number, you round it up to the next whole number. And in the answer, you deduct three overs for the change of innings interval. And that is your answer, how many overs remaining. So let's look at the calculation. So we know that at the start of the last hour, 20 overs had to be bowled. In our example, five overs was bowled. So we are now left with 15. So, so looking at the first bullet point, we now calculated the number of overs that remain to be bowled and I've, and I've started that number down. So it started with 20, but they've bowled five. So we we now remaining with 15. Then the last bullet point tells us, please subtract three overs for the change of innings interval. And your answer here is 12 overs to be bowled. So 12 overs is your answer in the first calculation that you need to do. And this is a calculation based on overs remaining. Before I go on to the next calculation, just for, in, uh, for interesting sake, it's not always that you, the overs that was bold in, in our example, if I, if I can go back, exactly five overs was bold. So at 17, 19, 
five overs was bowled when team A uh, was dismissed. It's not always the case that it's uh, exactly at the end of an over that a side uh, gets bowled out. So what happens, let's say, if a side gets bowled out in 4.2 overs? Again, we get guided. So just keep in mind, um, just for interesting sake, I'm mentioning this, not part of part of the answer, but just if you should get uh, um, uh, to a scenario or a question or a, in a game where there are where 4.2 overs was bowled when an innings ended. So uh, the law guides us here what we do. So we just follow the bullet points. We start with the first bullet point. So just in our example, 4.2 overs was bowled when the side was dismissed. So we uh, firstly go to the first bullet point. It tells us calculate how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. So we started with 20, 4.2 was bowled. So how many overs left? So now you need to, you need to, when you subtract the 4.2, you need to, to, uh, to give the fraction as well. You need to indicate exactly how many overs and balls left in the last hour. So 4.2 overs was bowled when the side was dismissed. So we started with 20, we subtract 4.2 from the 20, we now left with 15.4 overs. Now we've applied bullet point number one. The first bullet point, that is the answer. We've now served with 15.4. The second bullet point tells us if the number we've calculated in the first bullet point is not a whole number, and in our case, yes, it's not a whole number because we sit with 15.4. Now, because if it's a win, it's not a whole number, you need to round it up to the next whole number. So 15.4 rounded up to the next whole number is 16. So now we've got the answer in bullet point two. So now we've rounded it up to the next whole number, 16. And now the last bullet point tell us, please deduct three overs for the change of innings interval from the rem please deduct three overs for, for the change of innings interval from the answer that you've calculated. So in our case, 16 and we'll deduct three. We'll set uh, the um, answer is 13. What I've just mentioned was just um, another scenario. So if um, if you do get a question or in a game where a side gets pulled out in let's say 4.2 overs or 5.4 or 1.2 overs, that's how you deal it. But for this scenario, they were got dismissed in five overs, so it's 20 minus five, 15 remaining, and then you deduct the three for the change of innings. So now we were 12. So now we've done our calculation based on the overs remaining. Remember I said earlier, two calculations needs to be made. Let's go to our second calculation. Second calculation is based on time remaining. And here it tells us at the conclusion of the innings, you need to write down the time that's remaining until the agreed time for the close of play. Then deduct 10 minutes for the change of innings interval. Then a calculation to be made for one over for every completed three minutes of playing time remaining. And importantly, the last uh, uh, bit of the sentence, and you will plus one more over if a further part of three minutes remains. So let's just let's go through the answer and you'll just see exactly what the law is trying to tell us. So in our example, the last hour started at uh, five o'clock and we know uh, it ends at six. So now we are applying the first bullet point. So the first bullet point tells us when the innings ended and in our case, the innings ended at 17, 19. 
So when the innings ended, ended, what was the time remaining until the agreed close of play time? So we know our close of play time is, uh, is 1800 hours. Innings ended at 19 minutes past five. We now know there are 41 minutes left until the close of innings. Uh, and, uh, 41 minutes left in the, in the last hour. So now we've applied the first bullet point. Now we go to the second bullet point. Now it tells us that your answer in the first bullet point, which in our case is 41 minutes, please deduct 10 minutes for the change of innings interval. So after deducting 10 minutes from 41, you now left with 31 minutes. So now we've applied the, the second bullet point. The third bullet point. Now they say, do a calculation where for every completed three minutes, you will lose, you, you will get an over, plus one more over if a further part of three minutes remains. So if we do our calculation, we now know we say we left for 31 minutes. If we divide 31 by three, we get 10.33 uh, overs. Now, Lord tell us, so we've done our calculation for every completed three minutes, so that's 10 overs, and then the last portion of bullet point um, number three tells us, plus one more over if a further three, a part of three minutes remain, and that point three three, that is where a further part of three minutes remain. And because a further part of three minutes remain, you need to add another over. So you will take your 10 overs, you will add another over, and you now, your total year is 11 overs based on the time remaining calculation. So now we've got the answer for both calculation. Calculations, the calculation based on overs remaining, uh, what was our answer there? 12. Our calculation based on time remaining, the answer here is 11. So now, what do we do? We're sitting with a 12 and 11. The law tells us that use the greater of the two. So the overs remaining in our scenario in the last hour is a minimum of 12. You take the greater of the two. Third question that we covered in lecture two. Team A scores 600 in a three-day game. They then dismiss team B for 450 in their first innings. The captain of team A informs you that he wants team B to follow on. What is your response? So in terms of the follow-on target, what are they? For five days or more, they 200. For three and, or, and four days, 150. For two day match, 100. For one day, 75. So the minimum lead in a three day match is 150 runs. So in our scenario, Team A leads by 150 after the completion of the innings of Team B. So the captain of Team A shall have the option to enforce the follow on. Striker hits the ball to mid wicket and sets off for a quick single. The mid wicket fielder picks up the ball and try to run out the, the strike at the bowlers in. At the instant of the throw, while they were taking the first single, the batters have crossed. The ball then misses the stumps and goes over the cover boundary as the batters complete the fourth run. For three points, to explain what will happen next. So law tells us that when a boundary 
results from an overthrow or willful act of a fielder, the run shall be scored as follows. So once when there is an overthrow, and because of that overthrow, the ball, the ball now goes over the boundary. If that is the case, this is how you need to handle it. Firstly, any runs for penalties shall stand. So if, the, if there was a no ball bolt or your wide was bolt, that will stand. Secondly, you will allow the boundary. Remember in this case, they ran a quick single, feel the side at the bowler's end missed, ball then went over the boundary. So you will allow the, uh, the boundary. And then thirdly, runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress. But that run in progress, if they had crossed at the instant of the throw or, or the willful act, then that run will count. If they did not cross at the instant of the throw or the act, that run will not count. So this is how you deal with an overthrow if a boundary results from that overthrow. Penalties will stand. You will allow the boundary for. You will allow the runs that the batters completed together with the run in progress if they crossed at the instant of the throw. So in our example, you will allow four runs for the boundary. You'll signal this to the scorers and you'll wait for acknowledgement. You will allow the one run as the batters crossed at the instant of the throw. So in our example, maybe it's not that clear in the example, but the batters on the, uh, it, would they, it was a quick single that they ran. So the quick single while running the first run, the midwicket fielder picked up the ball and side at the bowler's end. At the instant of the, th of the throw by the mid-wicket fielder, the batters has crossed. And because they crossed, that run will then count. So in this example, total will be five runs, four runs for the boundary, and the one run because the batters crossed at the instant of the throw of the mid-wicket fielder. And how do we signal this five runs to the scorers? So you signal to the scorers by holding an op open palm facing your chest below head height and wait for acknowledgement from the scorers. So you'll first signal the four runs, you'll wait for acknowledgement, and then you'll signal uh, the five by holding an open palm and the palm should be facing your chest and the, your, the, your palm should be below head height and wait for the scorers to acknowledge. The fifth ball of the last over in a 50 over game. Team B needs five runs to win. The striker who's on 85 runs is currently batting with the number 10. The striker hits the ball towards the cover boundary and starts to run. The batters complete one run, but as the bowlers in umpire, you notice that the striker purposefully or willfully ran short at the bowlers in when turning for the second run. So the striker turning for the second, knowing it's, there's only one ball left after this ball and the striker wanted to be on strike. He didn't want the number 10 batsman to face the last ball. And because of that, that striker willfully or purposefully ran short at the bowler's end. Explain what happens next. You'll call and signal short run as soon as the ball becomes dead and you will inform the other umpire. Because of this willful or deliberate short run by the striker, you will disallow all runs to the batting side. You will return any not out batter to his or her original end. If there was a no ball or white from this delivery, it will always stand. 
You shall award five penalty runs to the fielding side and signal the, these five penalty runs to the scorers and wait for them to acknowledge. You shall inform the scorers to the number of runs to be recorded from this delivery. You shall inform everyone and report the incident to the governing body. Next question. Bowler bowls and in swinging delivery, pitching outside off stump of the batter. So when you get these type of questions, break it up into smaller pieces and also try to visualize. Visualizing these type of questions uh, is a, a great help and it, and it, uh, and it will assist you in answering the question. So the more, so what I see immediately is we are visualizing this better soldering arms. And then it tells you ball the eating better on the front foot, on his front pad, above the knee roll in line with the stumps. There's a huge LB appeal. The umpire turns down the appeal, the, the ball goes through the keeper's legs and hit the helmet placed behind the keeper. So firstly, what you need to cover in your answer is that when it comes to leg buys, you will only give leg buys if the umpire is satisfied that the striker either attempted to play at the ball with the bat or the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball. So that's the first part of the answer. You tell the, um, tell the examiner when it comes to leg buy, what are the conditions that needs to be met. Attempted to play the ball with the bat, or try to avoid eating, eating the ball with a bat. But we do know in this case, and it tells us the batter sold at arms. So now we know that the batter didn't try to play the ball with the bat, nor did he try to avoid being hit by the ball. So in this case, leg bias shall not be awarded. If the ball becomes dead for any other reason, the umpires are called and signal dead ball as soon as the ball either reaches the boundary or the completion of the first run. So in this scenario, this allow all runs to the batting side. Remember the batter didn't offer a shot. If they ran, you shall return any not out batter to his or her original in, signal noble to the scorers, award any five penalty runs, except if the ball should hit the, uh, the protected armament that was behind the keep. So that is what the law say. So now we know in this scenario, there wasn't a shot that was um, uh, offered and they didn't uh, run any leg by, but the ball went through the keeper's legs and hit the protective helmet behind the keeper. So as soon as the ball hit the protective helmet behind the keeper, the ball then became automatically dead. But the important part here is those awarding of five penalty runs for the ball hitting the keeper, the, the helmet behind the keeper, is not applicable in this scenario because if you read bullet point number four, it tells us when the batter does not uh, offer a shot or when the batter does not attempt to play at the ball with the bat, and in this case the batter soldering arms, if the ball should hit the pad, uh, sorry, I'm at bullet point four, because the batter didn't play a shot, the uh, the if the ball should hit the helmet behind the keeper, those five penalty runs shall not be awarded. And in this scenario, that exactly happened, and the law tell us you should not award the five penalty runs. So you the bowler in umpire, and you stand fairly close to the stumps. The bowler then delivers the ball 1.5 meters from behind you. As you are focusing on the pop increase uh, because uh, you are wanting to check whether the bowler's uh, um, foot landed behind the pop increase for the no ball, you then see out of your peripheral vision the ball passing past, uh, past you on, the, um, on its way to the bat. What do you do next? Because the bowler bowled the ball from behind you, call and signal dead ball as soon as you see the ball passing you. The ball do not count as a legal delivery in the over, that, and that ball needs to be rebolt. Any run scored or attempted from this particular delivery needs to be disallowed. If the batters ran, please send them back to the ends. 
place then on the bowler that if there are any further deliveries that you are going to bowl be from behind me, I will consider that as time wasting. Please also inform uh, the bowler's captain of uh, of what you've just of, of what you've just relayed to the bowler. And in the scenario, it says you you stood fairly close to the to the stumps. Maybe you can consider standing a bit uh, um, a, a few feet back um, to prevent the bowler from bowling from behind you. Striker does not attempt to play at the ball. Again, uh, you you uh, light should go on. Okay, doesn't play play at the ball. The ball then strikes the striker's pad, and now it goes to fine leg. The striker then calls for a quick single. Before the non-striker can make his ground at the striker's end, at the the wicketkeeper broke the stumps. There's a huge appeal by the fielding side. What happens next? So now we've just covered this in 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 the previous question. We now know that if no shot was offered, leg by shall not be awarded. But if the player should run, you need to give the fielding side an opportunity to run out the batters. That's why you need to delay your call of dead ball to as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. So if no shot was often offered, the ball then ricochets from the pad, the batters run, don't call dead ball yet, give the fielding side an opportunity to run out and on, uh, either of the batters. As soon as the, the, either the ball reaches the boundary or the batters complete a single, then you call and signal dead ball. So in this scenario, you need to give out the non-striker run out because the ball only becomes dead once the first run is completed. Because the first run is not completed yet, the, the ball is not dead. And lastly, so no runs are to be scored from, from this uh, delivery. And the incoming batsman needs to go. If there are still four of the balls to be delivered in the over, the incoming batsman needs to go to the non-strikers end. Again, when you see these, these um, long uh, questions, break them up into smaller pieces and try to visualize. So bowler bowling a short pitch ball, short pitch slower ball. The ball bounces halfway down the pitch. So visualize the ball bouncing halfway down the pitch. The striker then seeing this moves deep into his crease. Now the ball bounces a second time behind the popping crease. And after bouncing behind the popping crease, the striker hits the ball in the air towards the middle fielder. The fielder then catches the ball, the ball, but after catching the ball, the fielder then saw the better batter outside his crease. The fielder then has a sigh at the bowler's end and actually hits the stumps with the non-striker sort of his crown. The fielding team appealed and you all know for what they're appealing. They're appealing for the run out because they know the better batter is at the non-strikers end. So I can guarantee you they'll be appealing for the run out. So now you need to explain exactly what you're going to do and how you can see how important it is for for you to know uh, your laws because now you saw a catch, you you saw a run out happening. Which one? Which one do you apply? So now we know when it comes to a no ball and when the ball uh, bouncing twice, the law tells us that as soon, um, the umpire to call and signal no ball, if a ball bounces more than once, all rolls along the ground, and here are the important words, if that happens before reaching the popping crease. So that is what the law tells us. 
It's only a no ball if the ball bounces um, more than one or bounce, or in other words, bounce a second time or third time. If if that app is the second bounce is before reaching the popping crease. And if that is the case, call and signal no ball. So let's look at our scenario. The ball bounced once, it bounced halfway down the pitch. Where did it bounce a second time? It clearly tells us that the ball bounced a second time behind the popping crease. So we've just read the law that tell us if it bounces, and if you again, you must said visualize this. So the first bounce was halfway down the pitch. The second bounce was after or behind the popping crease. And because it was behind the popping crease, this is a fair delivery. It is only a no ball if it had to bounce before or bounce a second time before the popping crease. So because this bounce behind the popping crease, it's a fair delivery. Then the batter hits it straight to, 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 uh, to the cover fielder. The cover or the middle fielder then took the catch cleanly and then had a sigh at the stumps. So now there's a court and there's a run out. So now we know that in the law, court takes precedence over any other decision except for bold. So bold is number one, court is number two. So in this instance, the court will super override the, the run out or will take precedent over the run out. So bowler bowling in his delivery stride or while bowling, the bowler breaks the ball with, uh, breaks the wicket with his knee. And after the bowler releases the ball, it then goes on to hit the striker's wicket. So law tells us that either umpire to call and signal no ball if other than trying to run out of the, the non-striker, the bowler breaks the wicket at any time after the ball comes into play and before the completion of the stride after the delivery stride. This will include any clothing or any other object. So in our scenario, the bowler broke the wicket with his knee and now the law tells us that either umpire to call and signal no ball. Oh, and after delivering the ball, the, the ball then hits the striker's wicket. So the so striker is then out bold. But in this case, the striker shall be not out. Why not out? Because you, uh, you call the no ball, st uh, striker cannot be out bold. There's only three ways to be dismissed of a no ball. Bold is not one of them. Now we go over to the questions that we covered in lecture four. Again, with, with these uh, penalty time questions, it's important that you do break it up into smaller pieces. So what I do is the moment there's either an interval or a players needs to leave the field for, uh, let's say, a rain interruption, I work out the penalty time that the, the fielder owes us. So the moment there's either interval or interruption, work out the penalty time. It's uh, just uh, so much easier. So let's, we read the question, break it up into smaller pieces. So Paul, injured is growing at 10.48. Fazio runs onto the field, gives Paul a treatment. Paul only leaves the field at 10.50. There's a drinks break from 11.10 till 11.14. Paul comes back onto the field at 11.40. We took lunch at 12.20. After lunch, Paul threw the ball. Uh, the cap uh, after lunch, the captain of the field into the side throws the ball to Paul and he wants Paul to bowl the first over after lunch. What actions will you take? So firstly, Paul's penalty time will start from 10.50 and not 10.48. The, 
a wide, not 1048. Those two minutes while Paul uh, was given treatment, that two minutes gets taken into account when calculating the overrate of the fielding site. You can only penalize uh, the, the injured fielder um, or the injured fielder's penalty time will only start accruing once that fielder leaves the field of play. So in our case, Tom Le uh, Paul left at 10.50. Paul then returns at 11.40. So that gives Paul the 50 minutes that he was off the field of play. So Paul, that's 50 minutes of penalty time. But we do know that there was a drinks break from 11.10 till 11.14 of four minutes. So we know that drinks break is a scheduled interval. And scheduled intervals cannot add, be added to Tom's penalty time, nor can it be subtracted from to Tom's, uh, Paul's uh, penalty time. So the scheduled breaks cannot, will not count for or against Paul. So that four minutes needs to be subtracted from the 50, 50 minutes that he owes us. So when to Paul returns to the field at 11.40. He owes us 46 minutes. So good umpiring technique is as soon as Tom, as Paul, or uh, the injured fielder returns to the field, work out the penalty time, then inform the injured fielder and the captain the amount of penalty time that the injured fielder owes and when the injured fielder can bowl. It's good umpiring technique. So Paul returned at 11.40 and we know he, um, um, he owes us 46 minutes of penalty time. Lunch was taken at 12.20. So one of the met methods that penalty time can reduce is playing time on the field. As, as long as the injured fielder is fielding, that will that you can then that time that he was on the field, he can then offset that time from penalty time that he owes. So lunch was taken at 12.20. So from 11.40 when Paul returned until 12.20, that was 40 minutes that Paul was on the field. So Paul, at the start of the lunch interval, and I, and I said it's important, the moment there's an interval or interruption, calculate the amount of penalty time that any injured f uh, fielder uh, has. So at the start of the lunch interval, Paul owes us six minutes. How did I get six minutes? When Paul returned at 11.40, Paul owed us 46 minutes in total. Paul then was on the field for 40 minutes from 11.40 till 12.20. You can now offset that time that, was Paul, that Paul was on the field from the penalty time that Paul owed us. So 46 minutes minus 40, Paul owes us six minutes penalty time at the start of the lunch interval. What time will lunch in? Lunch will in at 1300 hours. So we know because lunch is a scheduled interval, this will not count for or against Paul. So at the end of the lunch interval at 1300 hours, Paul still owes us six minutes. So as you're walking onto the field, you will inform the, uh, Paul and the fielding captain that Paul still owes us six minutes. Paul can only bowl at 13.06. John pulls a hammy at three o'clock and leaves the field. T is taken at 15.20. John returns to the field at 15.50. At 16.10, the batting captain declares and he asks you when John can bat. What are you going to tell him? Again, with these type of questions, break it up into smaller pieces. So firstly, when did John leave the field? Three o'clock. When is T taken? 15.20. So at tea time, what do you ask yourself as you're walking off? Are there any players off the field? In our case, yes. 
uh, so on is off. You will calculate how many minutes he owes us at the start of T. So we know we know that John owes us 20 minutes at the start of the T interval. Then T is from 15.20 until 15.40. And this is a scheduled interval. So this will not count for or against John. John only returns at 15.50. So at the end of the T interval, which uh, at 15.40, John owes us 20 minutes, but John did not return with his side at 1540. He was still off the field. John only returned at 1550. So there was when John returned, play was in progress for a further 10 minutes. So from 1540 till 1550 that John was not on the field, that is more penalty time that John owes us. So now in total, when John returns to the field, he owes us 30 minutes of penalty time. And how did I get 30 minutes? 20 minutes before T, and then this 10 minutes after T. So in total, when John returns, he owes us 30 minutes. You please tell John upon his return at 15.50 how many minutes he owes us and when he can bill. Also tell his captain. So batting, now the batting captain declares at 16.10. And at 16.10, this will now be the start of the change of innings interval. How long is the change of innings interval? 10 minutes. So we now know the declaration happened at 16.10. At 16.20, uh, because the change of innings interval is always 10 minutes, play will restart at 16.20. This interval, this change of innings interval is a scheduled break and will not count for or against John. So when the batting captain declares at 16.10, you need to calculate how much penalty time John owes. us. So at the declaration at 16.10, John was on the field for 20 minutes. Remember, John returned at 15.50, and he owed us 30 minutes. But now he was on the field for 20 minutes until 16.10. So he owed us 30, he was on the field for 20 when the declaration happens, now he only owes us 10 minutes. So because John owes us 10 minutes, you need to inform the batting, uh, the, the, the captain that because John owes us 10 minutes, he can only bat at 16.30 or if five wickets are down. Striker hits the third ball of the over to fine leg and set off for a run. The batters complete three runs and as they turn for the fourth, the fielder that returned to the field without permission fields the ball. He then throws the ball to the keeper just as the batters completes the, completes the, the fourth run. What actions will you take? So this is now a fielder returning without permission. We all know there's quite a stiff penalty. So as soon as that fielder touches the ball, that ball becomes immediately dead. Then, umpire to award five penalty runs to the batting side because now a uh, fielder without permission touches the ball, five penalty runs to the batting side. We know that the runs completed by the batter shall be scored together with the run in progress at if they'd crossed at the instant when the ball became dead or when that fielder touched the ball. If there was a penalty, uh, if there was a no ball or a wide, that shall always stand. The ball shall not count as one for the over. The umpires to inform and uh, uh, inform everyone and also to report this to the governing body. The batters completed three runs, and because they did not cross yet when the ball becomes dead, only the three run, the completed three runs will count together with the five penalty runs. So in total, eight runs of this ball. Since the batters did not cross when the ball became dead, the non-striker needs to face the next delivery. And since the ball does not count as one for the over, 
there are still four balls remaining. And a good umpiring technique. You can write down the time, the over, the ball. When it's the next interval, just go to the scorers and just double check scorers after um, in over number 15, ball number three. Um, how many runs did you record? Just double check. If they have eight runs, you tell them, um, yeah, well done. If not, you would need to rectify them. At quarter pass one, the left arm spinner bowls towards the striker. The striker hits the ball against the helmet of the silly point fielder. The ball then ricochets in the air towards the cover fielder who catches the ball. The fielder seeing the inform batter at the non-striker sort of his ground, throws the ball, at, throws the wicket down at the, at the non-striker, at the bowler's end with the non-striker sort of his ground. So we know that a batter can be caught either, uh, off the helmet, if the ball goes against the helmet of the fielding side, ball ricochets in the air, the batter can be caught. So for three marks here, you first need to tell um, uh, us that the strikers out caught if the ball delivered by the bowler not being an, a no ball is then subsequently out as a fair catch. If the strikers then not out bowled, then he or she is out caught even though a decision against either batter for another mode of dismissal. So in this case, there's going to be two appeals, one for the cats, one for the for the run out, but I can guarantee you they're going to appeal for the run out uh, because they want the inform batter to be dismissed. But we know we know that you, so we have two dismissals here: run uh, this court and the run out. But court takes precedence over any other dismissal except bold. At 17.58, the final ball of the 104th over, the batter gets an inside edge to the ball. The ball then ricochets from the keeper's uh, visor back onto the stumps. Yeah, yes. Sorry, but the screen is still the. It's not visible, only it's for me, okay. I guess. OK, let me uh, let me let me just uh, reset. Thank you for for stopping me. I'm going to reshare my screen and let me know if you can you can now see it. Just give me a second. Are you now able to see my screen? Yes, that's better. Thank you. OK, now thank you so much for coming uh, for for uh, um, alerting me to not seeing my screen. The um, so ball ricochets from the keepers advisor back onto the stumps with the striker sort of his ground. So we know that the striker can be stumped even if the ball ricochets off the wicket keeper's equipment. So in this case, all they wanted to check is whether you know the law, if it hits the, key, the keeper's helmet and it ricochets back onto the stumps, whether you will give it out stump. Yes, it can. Uh, if the ball ricochets from any part of the keeper's person, or equipment, or if the keeper throws or kicks it onto the stumps and the striker sort of is a ground, striker should be given out stumped. Close of play in this three day game is six o'clock. At 17.52, Team Blue is 318 for nine. After 115 overs, 105.2 overs of the 120 uh, um, allotted for the day. The striker, then who is batting outside his ground to the spinner, edges the ball, and the ball is then caught by the first slip fielder off the keeper's grill. While all this happened, the, uh, the bowler in umpire actually called no ball for front foot being over the popping crease. The keeper seeing the striker, who is not attempting a, a run, is still outside his ground. And after getting the ball back from first slip, the, the wicket keeper breaks the wicket with the, with the striker outside the ground. So what we do know is, so what, what they wanted to test um, here is, as, uh, so either batsman is out or run out if 
while the ball is still in play and the wicket is fairly uh, put down by the striker, if there's nothing behind the crease, you can run out either of uh, the batter. But we do know that as soon as a no ball is called and a striker is out of his ground, not attempting a run, and the wicket is fairly put down by the keeper, the striker shall not be given out as soon as a no ball is caught. But in our scenario, the, there was an intervention from the first slip. So the ball went from, uh, from the edge of the batter to the keep, uh, off the keeper's grill to, to slip. And from slip, it came back to the keeper who then broke the wicket with the striker out of his ground. So in this instant, the striker is out, run out. Team Blues now all out. And the innings ended at 17.52 because we know, we know that if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the agreed time of close of play time, it will be stumps for that day and you will not start eight minutes earlier the following day. Last uh, lecture we did. First question for lecture six was the striker hits a leg side delivery to a position five meter in front of, of square leg. The striker calls for a quick single. As the batter's turn for a second run, the short leg fielder moves to his left, stuck out the foot, and the, one of the batters trips and falls to the ground. The mid-wicket fielder, meanwhile, as the as the non-striker is lying on the ground, picks up the ball, throws it at the striker's end with the striker sort of his ground. There's a huge appeal. What do you do? So this is a deliberate attempt by one of the fielding side to obstruct one of the batters. And if that is the case, call and signal dead ball. You ask the fielding side for the ball, you then go towards your colleague for consultation. One of the first questions you ask is, looking at the incident, was this a willful attempt by the fielder to either distract, deceive or obstruct either of the batters? In, in this scenario, yes, there was a willful attempt to trip the, 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 uh, one of the batters. So if there was a willful attempt to obstruct one of the batters, the following punishment applies. Firstly, neither batter shall be dismissed from the, that delivery. So in this instance, yes, there was an appeal for a run out of the striker. Yes, the striker was short of his, uh, um, his ground, but that uh, uh, the striker shall not be out. Because the law clearly tells us, because there was a willful attempt to obstruct the batter, neither batter shall be dismissed from this delivery. Furthermore, the bowlers in umpire shall award five penalty runs to the, uh, to the batting side. Signal this to the scorer and wait for them to acknowledge. You inform fielding captain and the batting captain. The ball do not count as one for the over. Any runs completed by the batter shall be scored together with any penalties. Also, the run in progress shall also be scored even if the batters hadn't crossed at the instant of the offence. This is the only instance in the law where whether the batters crossed or not, that run shall count. Furthermore, the batters at the wicket shall decide which of them is to face the next delivery. And report the incident to the governing body. So in this scenario, the batters completed one run. They were busy turning for the second. Yes, they didn't cross for the second, but the law tells us whether they cross or not, that run, that run will count. So in total here, there will be seven runs. Five, for the, five penalty runs, one for the completed run, and one run for the run in progress. So when it comes to this particular law, after the ball has been delivered, it can either be uh, the fielder distracting, deceiving, or obstructing. 
uh, an example of the deceiving is uh, is um, you know mock fielding the way the the fielder tried to deceive the batters from taking another run that also falls under under this particular law and is and is um, the same punishment i just wanted to bring under your attention that it can either be distraction or deceive uh, or they try to deceive or obstruct any of them they, um, these instances same punishment will apply Fast bowler bowls a full toss directed at the striker above waist height. The striker then hits the ball to find leg for boundary four. So what does law tell us? If the ball goes above waist height, the striker standing upright at the popping crease, call and signal no ball. And the reason for this is law tell us that if the ball would have passed or passed without pitching above waist height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease. So what is above waist height? You can usually just uh, um, um, belt, belt height. And the important part here is also, you need to judge the, uh, where the striker was at the popping crease. Sometimes you'll find the striker the double, double stepping. Do not judge it when the striker is halfway down the pitch and let's say a spinner bowling and the ball is is um, um, shoulder height and the ball is busy dipping. You need to judge it where the striker would have been if the striker should double check standing upright at the popping crease. That is your judgment point. The popping crease, not if the striker double stepped and the ball hit the striker halfway down the pitch. So at the popping crease, according to the law, this is dangerous and unfair and is irrelevant according to the law where the physical injury will would have been inflicted on the striker. If this is the case, I know there's certain playing conditions that differ slightly to the law, but in for the purpose of this course, we're only covering what the laws of cricket say. And the laws of cricket tell us any delivery that's above waist height of the striker standing up right at the popping crease shall be called noble. And after calling noble, what do you then do? The bowler is in umpire then to indicate to the bowler that this is your first and final winning. Also then inform the other umpire, inform the fielding captain and the batters. This first and final winning shall apply throughout the innings. Signal now this noble to the scorers and wait for them to acknowledge. Also, in this scenario, remember the batter he, um, actually hit the ball for a four. So you, you'll signal the noble to the scorers, you wait for them to acknowledge, and you need to signal the boundary four to the scorers and wait for them to acknowledge, and wait for them to acknowledge the boundary four. And there are four balls left in the over. During the morning session of a third day game, of a, on the third day of a three day game, you notice the, the striker running straight down the middle of the pitch. What actions will you take, if any? This is a three prong question. I'm going through the whole question, then we can go through the answer. So, this is now in the morning. You notice the striker running straight down the middle. What action will you take? That's the first part. Then after lunch, you notice again the striker running straight down the pitch. And then two overs before the drinks break in the middle se session. Now the non-striker runs straight down the middle of the pitch. What do you do? So in that first instance, uh, let me first cover what the law tells us. The law tells us that it's unfair to cause deliberate or avoidable damage to the pitch. Striker enters the protected area playing at the ball. The striker needs to immediately move out of the protected area. 
A battery will be deemed to be causing avoid avoidable damage if either umpire feels that he is or her presence on the pitch is without reasonable cause. So in this scenario, it, because it happened early in the morning and I saw for the first time the batters running straight down, I will have a word with both batters. I'll actually have a stern word with both batters because why? This is day three of a three-day game. And and um, the batting side may be on the verge of declaring. They now try to, to roughen up the protected area to bring the spinners in the game. So in this scenario, I'll have a stern word with both uh, batters. Seeing that this is the first time that they've run in the um, straight down the pitch, I'll have the first. And I'll tell them, if, um, if I see this happen again, I will go over to, to action. If this would have happened, let's say, in the second over on day one, um, I mean, there's no reason for the batters trying to deliberately damage the pitch to bring in their spinners. I will uh, have a quiet word with the batters if this happened early on, on, on day one. I will have a, a, a quiet word, and not in this case where it's day three, um, batting side on the verge of declaration, uh, trying to rough up the the um, the protected area to bring the spinners in the game. So that's why in this instant, have a stern word with the batters. Then after doing it again after lunch, now I, um, I spoke to you guys this morning. I'm now giving you your first and final warning. This warning to apply throughout the innings, the umpire then, even a batter gets dismissed, this warning shall apply to every innings and it's important that you inform each and every new batter coming in that uh, batter, your side is on the first and final warning for running in the protected area or causing avoidable damage to the pits. I will inform the fielding captain and when possible, cap the batting captain. Then when it happened the third time, now they've already on the first and final. Now they did it again, two overs after drinks. Now I'm going over to action. No more warnings, now punishment. Disallow all runs to the batting side. Return both batters to their original ends. Five penalty runs to the fielding side. Award any other five penalty runs except protective elements belonging to the fielding side. Inform everyone and report to the governing body. And there are four balls left in the over. Thank you so much, um, everyone. I've now gone through all the revision questions for that we've covered in from lecture one up until lecture uh, six. Um, we will now go over to Q&A. Um, I'll first go through to the chat box and after going through the questions in the chat box, I will then, go, I will then uh, take hands. Before I go to the, to the questions in the chat box, so when it comes to uh, these revision questions, the um, it's important go over the, the revision questions they are questions or so lots of them are questions that came up in previous level three um, exams they are good preparation for your up and coming level three exam together with the slide with the slides that we provided um, for lectures one to six Okay, let me go to the chat box. First question is from Cindy. Uh, Cindy asks, in what situation would you adjust the starting time or number of overs for the next day's uh, play? So Cindy, uh, when it comes to the laws of cricket, Laws of cricket does not accommodate uh, starting um, earlier um, the next day or making up overs. Um, there are playing conditions that covers this where you can start earlier and play later. 
But to answer your question, according to the laws of cricket, uh, unfortunately, uh, they do not cater for for starting, um, adjusting your starting time the next day. Uh, but the, the the lawmakers uh, uh, um, did include uh, that in certain in playing conditions for certain competitions where you can make up start earlier and also start later to make up time in case of um, inclement weather. Next question is from Sasikant. For the overs remaining to play, do we have to say minimum overs to be bowled? Because in some of the answers, we do not mention in the answer some of the revision questions. Um, yeah, yes, uh, it's uh, you You can add it, uh, Sasikant. It, it is um, in the last uh, in the, the last hour. And when we do speak about overs left, those are the minimum overs to, to be to be bowled. If uh, you're not going to lose a point, you're not going to uh, uh, get deducted the point if you do not put minimum. But it is good practice to actually say uh, um, when you do after doing your calculation, these are the minimum number of overs to be built. Yes, uh, good practice and good point, um, uh, Sasikant. Your next question, uh, Sasikant is uh, in your calculation based on overs uh, remaining whether it's 8.2 or 8.4 how do we round the last answer of overs uh, remaining so sasikan when there is when there's an inning change in the last in the last hour so you um, you need to do two calculations one based on time and one on overs so when it comes to your overs based calculation, so the first thing Sasikan that you need to do is you first need to calculate how many overs left after subtracting the overs that was bowled in uh, in the last hour. So let's use your example. Let's use the 8.2 as an example. So we know we start off in the last hour with 20 overs. So now 8.2 overs was bowled. So now you subtract the 8.2 from the 20. You now left with 11.4 overs. So that's the first calculation we do. We do subtract overs bowled from the overs that we started with. 20 minus 8.2, 11.4. Now your next, your next uh, thing you need to do. You need to ask yourself. The answer that I just calculated, is that answer a, a round number or a full number? If it's not a round or a full number, you need to round it up to the next whole number. So in your scenario or in our scenario where we used 8.2 with 8.2 overs was built, so we now sit with 11.4. That 11.4 overs left is not a, a, a round or full number. So we now need to round it up to the next whole number. So in rounding 11.4 up to the next uh, whole number is, is uh, 12 overs. So now we sit with 12 overs. And then we still need to subtract the three for the change of innings interval. So 12 minus three is nine overs minimum left in the last hour. I hope I've answered your question. If if I uh, if there's still uh, you still need clarity of any of the questions uh, that was asked in the chat box, feel free to raise your hand, and I will gladly clear up any um, any other if, if anything is unclear. Another one from Sasikant. Uh, question four, lecture two. Uh, the better completing the first run or the fourth run? Believe, it. yeah, yes, there is a typing error. I agree, agree with you, um, agree with you, uh, Sasikant. It, it, uh, the question could have been worded uh, a bit, a bit better, but uh, the uh, the point that they were trying to um, to get a Cross is that when it comes to um, overthrows, you need to judge where the uh, batters was, whether they crossed or did not um, cross. So in this scenario, 
the um, it was a quick single, and they when the ball was thrown, uh, they the batters crossed on in that first run, and then the ball went over the boundary. So all the uh, all they wanting to test is whether you you will uh, then allow the four runs for the overthrow, which you should, and they want to know whether you would have allowed the the extra run. So the important thing that you need to look out for is did they cross or did they not cross? In in this scenario, yes, they did cross. So you will allow that extra run, so five in total. So yeah, good observation. The question could have been put uh, better, but. But uh, as I explained, that's all they wanted to to test your knowledge is whether you uh, um, will award that extra run or not that extra run. Arun, uh, in the answers of many of the revision questions, the law numbers are referred to in bracket. Are we supposed to remember? Uh, no, uh, Arun. Um, just for reference purposes, just to make it easy, if you do want to go to your law book and check where the answer is, um, we've just uh, put those law numbers um, in brackets. Uh, but when it comes to um, answering in the uh, exam, um, no, you do not want to. Also, you do not need to quote the law verbatim. When marking, uh, when the examiners mark your, uh, mark your scripts, all they're looking for is whether you have an understanding of uh, what the law is and, and what to do. They do not look for uh, um, the law book to be regurgitated ver verbatim in your answers. Seriniket, uh, the PDF of exam, exam answer paper that needs to be photocopied is the same as that. Uh, yes, so the exact same process will be followed in the level three uh, yeah, exam. So um, uh, the, the questions will be put in the chat box. You will answer the questions. Uh, the the um, answer sheets will be, blank answer sheets will be provided to you, will be emailed to you. You write down your answers. After after writing down, oh, uh, there's about 27 questions. After writing your 27 questions, you're going to have to scan your answer sheets and then email it to, email, um, it to us. Same process we followed in the level two exam. I've handled all the questions in the chat box. Um, it's a... Um, Arun, I see uh, three or two hours. Level three is a three hour exam, um, Arun. Uh, uh, more questions. There are now 27 uh, um, questions and a lot more writing. So they're now giving you three hours instead of two hours. I'll come back to the chat box. Um, let me go to the hands. Nanes, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening, Abdullah. Good evening to you. Uh, yes, uh, I have two questions. The first one is short offer and art offer. Um, it's basically uh, the batsman has a back lift um, while preparing to face the ball. And he just uh, bring the bat down when the bowler delivers the ball. Uh, but the ball uh, went on to the leg side and he saw that one and he just stopped the bat. So he did not completely play at the ball, but he stopped his bat near his legs and before coming to all the way to the legs. So the ball uh, hit the leg, um, the pads, and then went to the square leg and then the batters ran a run. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in my opinion, then I said it's not short offered, so um, I called dead ball after they mm -hmm. finished their first run and sent both mm -hmm. the batsmen to their original end. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that fine? Uh, um, because the batsman he is still uh, bringing his bat all the way from behind uh, his back lift and to the plant. Do you consider that as a short offered or not? Thanks for your question, Anish. Now, yes, that is a judgment call that only you as the bowlers in umpire can make. So in your opinion, 
if you feel that the batsman did not offer a shot, it's your judgment call. You have the right to uh, wait until they completed the first run, then call and signal dead ball and send the batters back to the original end. And the batters will look at you and ask you. You can tell the batters, batters, in my opinion, you did not offer a shot. Go back. Um, that's why I'm disallowing this run, and I want you to go back to the your original end. So it is a judgment call. It's a judgment call that you need to make, uh, Nanis. And according to you, if you feel, uh, looking at um, uh, the shot that was played, that it was n uh, no shot was played um, at the ball, you... That's your call. You have the right to disallow that run. Did I answer your question, Anis? Yes, Sadhguru. Thank you. And another one is regarding uh, the youth, the under nineteen, uh, under seventeen uh, players uh, about the directives, uh, directives, especially uh, the bowling spells for the bowler. Yeah. Uh, is there any uh, specific um, re uh, regulations regarding the bowling spells of the under-17 uh, players? Um, yeah. Because in the ICC laws, um, we don't find anything, uh, but mostly it will be uh, mentioned in the match regulations, uh, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, yes, Nanesh, uh, there are bowling regulations or bowling restrictions in junior cricket. Uh, so whether it's under 11, under 13, 15, uh, 17, uh, there are bowling regulations. Uh, sometimes even the un, in, un, the under 19 co competitions, there are playing conditions in place, bowling directives that are uh, where, where they put in place, uh, especially for the fast bowlers, that they can only bowl a certain amount of overs in, the, in a spell. It differs from um, age group to age group or competition to competition. Uh, I've seen um, in some competitions, they allow a uh, maximum five overspells. I've seen, I've seen four overspells. I've seen three overspells. But those, uh, those are uh, guided by um, playing conditions on this, um, or um, and uh, bowling directives that gets incorporated um, into the junior competitions. So yeah, they are um, in all countries, especially in South Africa, in all age groups, there are bowling directives in place. Uh, where they only allowed to bowl the fast bowlers, especially a max of a certain number of overs in a spell. Yeah. Uh, did I answer your question, Anis? Yes. Yes, Abdullah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other hands? I don't see any other hands, but let me go to the chat, chat box. Maybe um, there is... Have... Uh, yes, up. I'm sure. Yes, Wilma. <laughs> Sorry, Bavesh did have his hand up um, and then he put it down. I'm not sure if he still wants to ask his question. Uh, Bavesh, if you want to ask a question, any uh, question, don't be shy. Um, I'll gladly answer it. Let me just go to the chat box again. I don't see anything in the chat box. I'm going to the, I don't see any, any hands. Okay, well, while we, but maybe they're still thinking of one or two questions. Uh, let me just go through uh, a bit of admin. Firstly, um, with the exam, there are two sittings next week, my, um, Wednesday, or and uh, next the following Saturday, Tom will send out a detailed email explain uh, explaining the process that we will follow in the next uh, day or two. But I can tell you now, we will follow the exact for those that wrote the level two exam, we are going to follow the exact same. Um, process for the level three um, exam. But as I said, they will be, um, Tom will send out an email explaining uh, everything. If you need any clarity on anything, uh, feel free to email uh, Tom and myself. Um, 
we will then gladly um, answer any questions with regards to the exam. I, um, I saw Anne, uh, Srini Keith, um, are you camera shy? You feel unmute yourself and ask uh, me a question. Yeah, no, sir. Uh, my question was like uh, the second uh, level two, level two exam, uh, we got the question paper through mail and we were made to delete the mail. So in the level three, uh, uh, you you told that it will be uh, uh, questions in the chat box. So yeah. that is uh, right uh, what I heard or will that be a mail kind mm. of thing or is uh, You are right, Sriniket. So we... So initially, we emailed the, the question papers to candidates and then we asked them to delete it. Uh, but then we found out that um, the Microsoft Teams does have a functionality in the chat uh, box where you can copy and paste questions. So after finding out that they do have that fun functionality, we now change the method of providing the, the questions. So now we have an, the new method is we post the questions in the chat box. So uh, if you register for the exam, the link gets sent to you. You will then see the questions in the the chat box and you can then answer accordingly. So yes, that is the new way of of how the exam will be conducted. Questions in chat box you answer them on your answer sheets, um, you PDF them, uh, scan them, and then email your answer sheet to us. Yes, sir. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Oh, but mm -hmm. I have a small suggestion, like yeah, just if there is any option, like only for the admins uh, to send the uh, chats, because if someone keeps on typing the question, it's on going up, so it will be difficult for us to you know, search and write. So, if you're like, if there is any option, like only you can write the questions and send, and all other participants can, you know, just uh, you know, cannot type it, that will be very helpful. Uh, yes, I will relay that message to Tom uh, Sriniket. Yes, sir. thank you, thank you. Um, next hand up, uh, Bavis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdullah. Abdullah, I have a question regarding the Beamer. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a batsman, he sees the ball is coming all the way up above the vest, but it's the slower mm -hmm. one. And then he yeah. keeps himself down and turn out that the, the bells are going off. So he's actually bold. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, since he dipped down, uh, how do you judge and what are the action do we do in this case? Thanks for your question, Bavis. So we need to apply the, the playing condition, Bavis. The playing condition guides us here when it comes to uh, full tosses above waist tie. Playing condition tells us that, or the law tells us, you need to judge if a ball on the full is above waist tight and it goes uh, past or uh, would have passed or um, uh, or either batsman or would have passed uh, the batsman standing upright at the popping crease that is what the law tells us above waist tight batsman standing upright at the popping crease so that is the, the your judgment call that you need to make you need to ask yourself was the ball above waist tight uh, when it passes the batter standing upright at the popping crease. If your answer to that question is yes, you need to apply the law. And the law tells us, call and signal no ball. It's irrelevant, don't look at what happened afterwards, because players don't know the law, they will argue, yeah, but the ball went against the wicket. Your judgment call by this is, when the ball, uh, um, uh, um, when the beamer, when above waist height of the striker, so you first ask yourself, was it above waist height? And secondly, um, did it go uh, past the batsman standing upright at the popping crease above waist height? If your answer to that question is yes, 
you need to apply the law and the law tell us call and signal no ball. So yes, there will be an argument. Yeah, but the ball gets into the wicket. You applying the law. The law tell us if it if it would have passed above waist that bat, the standing upright, you call. Yeah, I completely did I agree. Did I answer your question? <coughs> did, I, did I answer your question, Bavis? Yes, but my question was, uh, of course, that's absolutely correct. I would apply all the all the necessary steps. Uh, but mm -hmm. how about, as you just mentioned, the batsman has to be stand upright in the popping crease. And yeah. If he's avoid hitting ball on his body because it's a full toss beamer and it's coming yeah. all the way on top and going down. And to avoid yeah. that ball hit to his body, he mm -hmm. puts himself down. And during that time, yeah. if the wicket falls, do you consider still a no ball? Or do you consider because he was not standing upright and that's why uh, 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 you can give him out? Yeah, so, 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 Bavis, you, you uh, said it makes it difficult if the batter ducks because your yeah. judgment call and you need to judge if that batter was standing upright at the at the popping crease, would it would it have been above waist height? That is the judgment call that you need to make. It's a it's a difficult judgment call, but you need yeah. to make that judgment call. You need to judge if that batsman had to stand up. Would it have been above waist height? If the question to that answer is, if this specimen was standing up, it would have been above waist height. You need to call and signal no ball. Difficult call, Bavis, but you need to make that judgment call. And the question you need to ask yourself, if better standing upright, would it have been above waist height? If yes, no ball. Yeah, clear, very clear. So regardless what, batter's action is at that moment. Yeah, 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 clear. Thank I you. agree with you. And the, the similar thing applies to Bavis. Let's say the batter's double step. And, and just if you can visualize the scenario, spinner bowling. He bowl, mm -hmm. Spinner bowls a loopy, a loopy, uh, um, a, a loopy, if you know what I mean, a, the ball full loops toss. towards the batman. Uh, yeah. So it's a loopy full toss. The batter double steps. When so the, by double stepping, uh, if you can visualize, the batter is let's say almost halfway down the pitch. Maybe not almost halfway, but let's say two meters down the pitch. Yeah. When the ball reached the batsman, it was it was shoulder height. So at that stage, was the ball above so uh, was the ball above the waist? Yes, the ball was above the waist. But remember. There's a, there's a second condition that you need to look at before you can call a no ball. What is that second condition and when do you need to make that judgment call? At the popping crease. You need to make at the popping crease. That is where you need, that's the second condition that needs to be met before you can call it the no ball. And that is where you need to judge. Again, difficult call because you, you need to make a judgment call. The batter is three, two, three meters down, down the pitch. Yes, the ball. The ball, um, uh, let's say, was was uh, um, pressed uh, height. Yes, it was above waist. But that judgment call that you need to make, was it above waist height? When uh, um, would it have been above waist height if the batter was standing at the popping crease? If the answer to that question is yes, you need to call and signal no ball. If the answer to that question is no, you you don't call and signal no ball. But Better will complain, yeah, uh, umpire, it was ab above waist height. Then you tell the better, that is not where I judge. Yes, it was above waist height, but my judgment call is I need to judge if the ball was above waist uh, when you st uh, stood at uh, better standing at the popping crease. And ac my, according to me, if you stood at the popping crease, that ball would not have gone above waist height. That's why I didn't call it um, no ball. Understood. Do you still take a support from strikers and empire at the same time? Uh, when it comes to these type of calls, Bavis, uh, strikers in umpire is in the best position to make that call. Yes, the bowlers <clears throat> in will signal to the scorers, but strikers in because strikers in is 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 uh, as a as a square view or side on view. 
strikers in is in a much better position to make that call. So as bowlers in, what I will do is I will look at my at my my colleague at strikers in, and I will I will back my colleague. Uh, um, 99.9% of the time. I always back my colleague. If my colleague tells me it uh, uh, makes a call and it's not above or whether it's above, I will 99% of the time back my colleague. There are times where you can make a call. Uh, I had instances where it was a low setting sun and and my colleague at Strikers in um, um, couldn't pick up the flight of the ball because of the low set, setting sun. I also had an instance where there was there was uh, the 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 background. There was uh, um, there was um, a red chase in 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 the in in the stand, and because of the redness in the stand, my colleague at, at strikers in couldn't pick up the, the flight of the ball. But the fly, but the beamer was almost uh, head height of the batter. So I looked at my colleague. Uh, my colleague was you could see he was blinded by the sun. Then I made the the call of uh, calling and signaling no ball. But mo- but. 99.9% of the time, you do look at your colleague at strikers in, and you do you do back your colleague, back your colleague's call. Don't override it unless you now see or your colleague indicates to you, uh, um, this, oh, um I lost the ball. You know, you need to make a call. Then you can make a call. But strikers yes. in to answer your question, Bavis, the strikers in needs to make that call because from side on. He or she is in a much better position to make that call. Understood. Very clear. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Babis. Uh, next hand is uh, Pankaj. If you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask where, uh, if I not, I'm not getting a chat box uh, option in my Microsoft team, then how can I get the question paper of uh, level three exam? Pankaj, that is a good question. Uh, um, I, uh, um, are you sure you, you don't get the chat box option in Teams? I thought the chat box option is available in all versions of, of Teams. It's part of it, it, it's a, you know part of the, the, the product. Are you sure that your version of Microsoft Teams doesn't have a chat box? Yeah, yeah, I don't have. Because as far as my knowledge, and I've seen different versions of chat of, of Microsoft Teams, they all have a, a chat box. First time I hear that they don't have a chat box. Um, I don't know the answer. I will have to ask um, that question to Tom, and I'll ask Tom then to include it in in the um, the email that he's going to send out to the to the. Um, to the attendees uh, in the next day or two with regards to to the exam. So, uh, okay. so um, I'll have to get, we'll have to get back to you, uh, Pangat. Um, uh, yeah. um, I don't have an answer for you now. Okay, okay, thanks. But as I said, I'll ask Tom to address it uh, in the email um, that he's sending out in the next day or two. Okay, okay, no problems, thanks. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Pankaj. Uh, next hand is Ivan. Ivan, if you can unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Uh, now, Ivan, there's a lot of background noise, so what I suggest is you put your question in the chat box, and I'll gladly, I'll gladly answer your question. So there's, there's lots of background noise, Ivan. Uh, Put question chat box. I'll ask. I'll answer it after reading it. I'm now going to the next um, hand up. Um, Ramesh, if you can on uh, you if, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the same problem as the Pangaj. For me, also the same problem. The chat box is not showing in the uh, Microsoft team. In the level two exam, also the same problem occurs. So this Tom sent to me the e- send send me as an email the question paper. So this time also, is it possible like that? Uh, I, I'm I'm sure if you did it in uh, in the level two exam, uh, then it is possible. Uh, uh, Pankaj, there is your answer, uh, but I will uh, definitely double d- double check uh, with Tom. But uh, the um, Ramesh just gave you your answer for those. Um, um, 
that does not have a, a tab box a option in Microsoft Teams, Tom then um, emails the, the the question paper uh, to them. But uh, but I will double check and uh, um, I will ask Tom to address it in in the admin email that he's going to send out um, in the next yeah, day or two. I have this issue from the um, one month onwards because in the level two exam, mm -hmm. well, the same thing happens. Uh, so that's time is Tom send this uh, question paper to my email ID, and after that I will share my screen and uh, delete my uh, delete the uh, question paper from my side. Yes. Yeah, 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 that's the way. So after the exam, you, um, Tom would, would want them to see you delete um, the question paper permanently. Uh, yes, Ramesh. Okay, yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Me. Thank you for helping me out. Thank you for helping me out, Ramesh. Thank you. Are there any other hands? Let me go to the chat box. Um, I don't see any other um, hands. Um, I do see a comment by Nazmi in the chat box. Um, uh, Ramesh and Pangat, do, do you, um, um, are you able to update your, your Microsoft Teams uh, uh, version? Maybe you, you still have an old uh, um, Microsoft Team uh, version. Maybe the, the first ones uh, um, uh, didn't have a chat box, but uh, uh, but the new ones, I'm 100% certain they all have that functionality. So maybe um, just a comment that I've read in the in in the in the in the chat box. Yeah, uh, from, the, yeah. from my side, uh, from my side, I checked the community of the Microsoft, and uh, there is something is uh, written regarding how how can I can get back the chat box. I tried all the steps mentioned in that one, but mm. still it's not showing. Mm. Okay. My side. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. No problem. But uh, again, um, uh, Tom, uh, um, um, Tom mailed the question paper to those that couldn't, uh, that don't have a chat box, and after the exam, you need to delete it. We can do that option. Um, uh, thanks, Ramesh. Yeah, uh, same case with me. I have tried all the options, uh, and yeah. right now I'm using it from the Explorer, so I'm not getting the uh, chat box option in that from the Explorer version of uh, Microsoft. Okay, the um, there's another comment. Um, Bavesh is saying, um, remove the app and then reinstall it again. Have you tried that option? Um, uh, Pangaj, Ramesh. Uh, in my version of uh, Windows, the uh, new version is not able to uh, install. Actually, <coughs> uh, I have the old version of content. Windows 8, so mm. it is not okay. installing on that version mm. right now. Mm. Okay, right. but but anyway, uh, Tom, we have a solution for this. Uh, um, Tom, then uh, for those. Uh, um, um, that doesn't have access to chat box. Tom will then email you the question paper, but I'll ask him to confirm in the in the admin email that he's going to send within the next day or two. So thanks, Pangat. Thanks, Ramesh. Yeah, uh, Sasikant, I see your hands raised. The floor is yours. Uh, I just have some uh, information on uh, connecting to the teams. I think if you use the link. Uh, you send us and then uh, join as a guest. Uh, if you use that link, uh, you will get the chat box. But if you download the Teams and then use the downloaded one, it will not get the uh, chat chat uh, option. If you, I think you can try that out. Uh, uh, Pangas, Ramesh, there's um, good advice from Sasikant. Uh, click on the link. And then it will give you access to the to the chat box. So so what I do, what I suggest is uh, over the next week, only writing next week. So maybe over the next day or two, get one of your friends to send you a link. Uh, click on it, uh, open Teams, and then see if you can see the chat box. Uh, if yes, then there's your answer. Uh, if no, then um, we will then do it um, as we did it in the level two exam. But thanks for that um, feedback, Sasikant. 
I'm going we'll to the chat box. We'll try for that one. I think it's uh, maybe in browser it will be work, but I don't know whether it's. Uh, anyway, we'll check with the browser. Like once we are using the okay. app, maybe it's not working because I tried already in the uh, app side. It's not working. Maybe in browser okay. it will work. I will try that one. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sasika. I uh, don't see any other hands. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, going once, going twice. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us for these seven lectures. It was a pleasure being part of this. Um, all the best for your exam. Exams. I will definitely see all of you uh, next week at the, the exams, whether it's uh, uh, virtually or face to face. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.